morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Research Bureau's third in this series of events commemorating our 25th anniversary. My name is Roberta Schaefer, and I am the president of the Research Bureau. We'd really like to express our extreme gratitude to the Massachusetts College of uh, Pharmacy and Health Sciences for allowing us to use this beautiful facility and uh, all the events have been here, and this is the, they've just been great about uh, allowing us to, to, uh, to be here. Unfortunately, no one is here from the college today, but we really want to thank them uh, for uh, this space. Today's program, as I said, is the third installment of our five-part uh, speaker series, which is based on the overall theme, Cities, Mapping the Road to Success. Our 25th anniversary brochure outlining all the events is available on our website. Uh, and there are also brochures uh, at your seats that uh, give you all the, uh, all the events. Each event features a nationally recognized expert to discuss challenges facing cities like Worcester. The speaker series, like all Research Bureau events and reports, is available to the public at no cost due to the generosity of our many supporters and sponsors. And I'd like to recognize our 25th anniversary sponsors including um, Commerce Bank, which has been our presenting sponsor. Um, and thank you, Brian Thompson, and many of your staff who are here today. Bowditch and Dewey, our leadership sponsor. Um, thank you, George Tetler and Richard Foote and others from Bob Long Longden and others from Bowditch and Dewey who are here today. And also, today's event is being sponsored by Rand Whitney Container. Um, and my my, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to Nick Smith, who's the president of uh, Rand Whitney Container. Um, other major sponsors are Fallon Community Health Plan, Polar Beverages, Unum, and Massport. And all our other sponsors, of which there are many, are listed in the brochure on your chair and on our website, wrrb.org. The Research Bureau also wishes to express its appreciation to the Telegram and Gazette, with which the Research Bureau has had a very special 25-year relationship and Worcester Business Journal for advertising today's event. And finally, I would like to thank the City of Worcester Government Channel uh, for videotaping our programs for rebroadcast in Worcester and nearby towns, and also uh, the City of Worcester for putting our uh, programs on, our, on their website so that you'll be able to see, uh, for those people who are, uh, could not be here, or want to see it again, it will be on, uh, there's a link on the city's website and you can link onto our, our, our website and get that link. Uh, and th thank you to the city manager for making that service available to the public. <clears throat> now that I've done all the thank yous, um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Alan Ehrenhold. And following his uh, presentation, we'll have time for questions uh, from the audience and we'll have microphones going around, so please raise your hand if you've got a question. Alan Ehrenholt is the Director of Information at the Pew Center on the States, a division of Pew Charitable Trusts in Washington, D.C. Until January of 2010, he, served, he had served for 19 years as the executive editor of Governing Magazine. And prior to joining Governing, Mr. Ehrenholt's professional career um, included stints at the Associated Press, the Washington Star, and Congressional Quarterly. He's the author of three books, the United States of Ambition, The Lost City, and Democracy in the Mirror. His newest book, The Once and Future City, is scheduled for publication in 2011, and his talk today will be based on, on that. Mr. Aaron Holt has a BA from Brandeis University and an MS in Journalism from Columbia. He was a Nyman Fellow at Harvard from 1977 to 78, and he's currently a lecturer in, the school, lecturer in the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. In 2000, he was the winner of the American Political Science Association's McWilliams Award for Distinguished Contributions in the Field of Political Science by a Journalist. We're very pleased that Alan Ehrenthold is here with us today to share his insights about cities with us. Please join me in welcoming Alan Ehrenthold to Worcester and to our series. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, I've had two really scary, I've given a lot of speeches, and I've had two really scary experiences. 
Uh, one was years ago when I spoke to a group of state legislators, and I brought my speech up to the podium, and a big fan blew them all so that you couldn't tell which page was which. And uh, I was petrified, and I finally gathered them all up and said, I'm going to give this speech in the order in which I have collected the pages. <laughs> if they don't happen to make sense, then you'll know why that is, or you might. Uh, as it happened, people laughed at that, and while they were laughing, I got the speech back in order, and it worked out fine, and some people actually thought I had done it on purpose. No one will think I did this on purpose. I left my speech in the cab. <laughs> um, fortunately, this is the computer era, and I have it right here. So I don't have to collect a bunch of, piece of pa pieces of paper that were not clipped together, and I thank the tech staff for making that possible, and uh, any errors in logic that you detect will be mine rather than based on collection of papers. I want to start by telling you a story. Uh, it's a story about Chicago, where I came from. In, in uh, February of 1979, uh, there was a huge snowstorm, uh, 22 inches. And traffic and transit were snarled, as you might expect. And it resulted in the defeat of a mayor. The reason was that the CTA trains were all full when they left the outer stations, meaning they were all full with white middle class residents. And by the time they got to the inner city where minorities were waiting to get on, there was no room. In fact, the trains were passing the stations. And there was such an outcry in the minority community that Mayor Belandic lost to Jane Byrne. Some of you may remember or be familiar with this incident. I bring it up to say it couldn't happen today. Not because the CTA is perfect, as any of you who have written it in Chicago know, um, but because what would happen is the minorities and immigrants would all be in the, in the train from the outer areas, and it's the wealthy people on the inside who couldn't get in. That's what's happened to Chicago since 1979. Uh, it's called sometimes gentrification, uh, which is a loaded word that I try not to use, although I sometimes slip and no doubt will today. In my view, it's something more complicated and profound than gentrification. A better description, which I am proud to say I invented, and not too many people have taken up, but a few have, <laughs> is demographic inversion. That is, Chicago is coming to look like a traditional European city, uh, like Vienna or Paris in the 19th century, or for that matter, Paris today. The poor and newcomers are on the outskirts, the people who live near the center, some minorities, but mostly white, are those who can afford it. Um, the reverse of what we came to expect in America in the 21st, at least in American big cities in the 21st century. Atlanta's a good example. Atlanta is shifting, and I, and I do not mean to endorse or to comment on the correctness of any of these changes, but merely to document them, because they're, they're correct. Uh, Atlanta is shifting from an overwhelmingly black to a minority black city. And most of us think of Man Atlanta as a heavily black city. It came within about 300 votes just this spring of electing a white mayor, which would have been the first one in Atlanta since 1973. The black population in Atlanta since 1990 has gone from 67% to under 55%. Some of that is because whites are moving in, particularly to Midtown, where there's a huge development called uh, Atlantic Station, which you may be familiar with. But it's more due to blacks moving out. The suburbs are where blacks are settling in Atlanta, and especially where immigrants are settling. Do some of you know Gwinnett County uh, in the suburbs of Atlanta? A few of you do. If you do, you know that it's classic 1980s subdivision suburbia, cul-de-sacs, SUVs, gas grill, I like to say gas grill suburbia. In 1990, it was 90% white. It's now majority minority. And we're not talking about right over the edge of Atlanta. We're talking about a place where the county seat is 25 or 30 miles away from the Atlanta city limits. It's majority minority. Hispanics, Koreans, Indians, Chinese. I'm going to tell you another quick story. Parkview High School in Gwinnett County in Lilburn was voted five years ago the number five by Sports Illustrated was voted the number five among athletic schools in the entire country. Um, this year it could not field a ninth grade football team. 
The reason for that is because there has been such a heavy influence of Asian Indian students who didn't want to play football that there weren't enough to field a team. Now, ninth grade football isn't a big deal, but it is the feeding ground for the varsity football teams that had been the pride of this high school for so long. By the way, they're doing very well in math and chess, <laughs> but not football. You will be surprised at this, but every attempt I have made to verify it has shown it to be correct. Of the immigrants coming to Atlanta, to the metropolitan Atlanta from foreign countries, the percentage that settle within the city limits of Atlanta, 4%. The rest go to the suburbs. So race and ethnicity is a huge issue in uh, demographic inversion. But it's not always the issue. Think about Lower Manhattan, where I know most of you have been. Um, in 2001, the population living in Lower Manhattan below the World Trade Center was 25,000. It's now 60,000. Now, it hasn't grown in the recession because people, as in much of the country, are essentially frozen in place. You can't sell anything. You can't buy anything. You stay where you are. But it hasn't gone down. Here's one I bet you didn't know. On the south side of Wall Street, from Broadway all the way to the river, on the south side of the street, every building except the stock exchange is a residence. Wall Street is turning into a residential neighborhood. That transition, which was an explosion in 2006 and 2007, has essentially stopped. I would say paused. But I see no reason to believe that it is paused forever. One quarter of the households in this area are couples with children. They're wealthy couples. The average income uh, in some of these buildings that I, when I looked at it last, was $262,000. Uh, if you had two jobs on Wall Street, you could afford that. Um, how many people are able to afford it now? I don't know. I haven't looked in the last few months. But the household size in lower Manhattan is higher than in the rest of the borough of Manhattan. It's quite remarkable. We're talking about Wall Street. Ten years from now, assuming the economy comes back, God knows it ought to come back in ten years, lower Manhattan could be a residential neighborhood with a modest presence of financial corporations and financial service jobs. That's, what, that's the direction it was going in in 2007. I don't see any reason to think it won't continue to go in that direction when money loosens up a little bit. This is not exactly demographic inversion as, uh, as we, or gentrification. It's not gentrification because there wasn't anybody living in Lower Manhattan in 1970. There were fewer people living in Lower Manhattan in 1970 than there had been in 1800. So condos are replacing office buildings, not poor people. And you don't have the issues of gentrification there that you have in other parts of America. But still a dramatic demographic change. But if you want to see something really dramatic, or just go to a nice place, go to Vancouver. Anybody go to the Olympics in Vancouver? Or been there recently for any reason? Um, you may have seen Vancouver on TV if you go to Vancouver, you see the real city, which is a city of 600,000, roughly 20% of whom live within a couple square miles of the city center. Downtown Vancouver is a forest of slender green skyscrapers with three-story ta three townhouse units at the base. In the morning, nearly as many people commute out of downtown Vancouver into jobs in the suburbs than commute in. Now, no American city looks like Vancouver right now. Worcester obviously doesn't look anything like it. But quite a few spent the last decade trying, even ones you wouldn't expect. Sunbelt Auto Cities, Charlotte, Phoenix, Albuquerque, Salt Lake City, Dallas, putting up downtown condos, a lot of which they haven't been able to sell since 2008, but they put up the condos. Eventually they'll sell. Building light rail systems, the condo market stalled, but the desire is still there. I call this the Pinocchio syndrome. One of, one of the uh, ordeals to which I subjected myself in working on this book was to read the entire story of Pinocchio, and it is really boring. However, there are a couple of lessons in it. You know how Pinocchio wanted to be a real boy, not just a wooden puppet? Well, leaders in Phoenix will tell you almost as if they were characters in Pinocchio, almost as if they were Pinocchio, 
that they want to have a real city, a city with a heart, with a downtown, so they can be competitive among global cities in the new century. It's important, and here I make a general point that I want to stress, it's important not to overdo this. We're not witnessing the abandonment of the suburbs or the movement of tens of millions of people back to the city. Um, the numbers are still pretty small in most cities outside a handful that I have described and a, a relatively small number of others. But, and here is the point, we are living in a moment when the massive outward migration of the affluent that characterized the last half of the 20th century is coming to an end. It's coming to an end and we'll see it when the economy picks up. For decades, many cities have talked about, and you have talked about it here, of the need to have a 24-7 downtown, a place where people live as well as work. Busy streets, interesting streets, safe all day, all night. This is Jane Jacobs, vintage Jane Jacobs, for some of you who have read her. And I am a great admirer of Jane Jacobs. But the theory was, and it's largely been accepted, that only when significant numbers of people lived downtown could central cities regain their historic role as magnets for culture and a source of identity and pride for metro areas. Now that's starting to happen. Why is it starting to happen? Well, several reasons. They won't all, uh, they won't all be obscure to you. One, the deindustrialization de of the central city has eliminated many of the things that made affluent people want to move away, right? We don't make much of anything downtown anymore in America or anywhere near it. So the noise and grime that, that prevailed for most of the 20th century have gone away or almost gone away. Lower Manhattan, when you visit it, may seem loud and a little gritty to you, but I guarantee you it is not like the city of L trains, tenement manufacturing, horses and coal dust that was Lower Manhattan in the early 1900s. So a third floor factory loft in Soho, or for that matter in St. Louis, can be marketed as attractive and stylish. Um, and builders are building new lofts, which if it's not a contradiction in terms is a little odd because a loft is an old building that's been converted uh, to uh, gentrified use. Building a new loft seems a little unusual, but that's happening. So the deindustrialization of cities is one reason why people are able to move back to the center and are doing it in the biggest cities in America. Not, the Det not Detroit, obviously, not so much Cleveland, but the cities we would regard as the most successful of the big cities, New York, Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, Minneapolis, and I'm leaving out a few others that I should be including, are all experiencing this. And deindustrialization is one reason. A second one is the fact that the scourge of urban life in the 70s and 80s, random street violence, um, has gone down, has gone down dramatically. Um, murder rates in some cities in the 2000s have gone up, but they're mostly gang related. Uh, the number of random murders or uh, aggravated assaults is much lower than it was 30 years ago. And middle class people, I would submit, of all colors, began to feel safe on the streets of Amer urban America in the 1990s and still feel that way. The fear that anybody of middle age recalls from the 1970s, and some of you will recall it, maybe with a chill, that the shadowy figure passing you by on a dark street late at night is likely to be a mugger. Well, it still could be a mugger. But that's rare these days, and it's almost non-existent among young people. Young people don't fear this. In Washington, if you, go, if you go to the corner of 14th and U Street, this is the center of the riot corridor, 1968, after the death of Martin Luther King. It was a place that outsiders feared to venture in for 30 years, literally 30 years. It's now the liveliest part of the city for kids under 25. Even though some physical scars remain, it's not physically back to what it was before 1968, and it wasn't beautiful before 1968. But it's where young people want to go, where the hot bars are, where the good music is, what they consider good music anyway, not necessarily what I would choose. The young people who have reju rejuvenated 14th and U believe that this recovering slum is a place where they want to spend time, and increasingly, 
where they want to live. And you see that when you go there. Remember, this is the generation, it's not the generation that watched Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver. This is the generation that watched Seinfeld, Friends, and Sex in the City. Mostly from the comfort of suburban sofas, but they were watching Central Cities from the, from the comfort of suburban sofas. So we've gone from the sitcom world of Beaver and Father Knows Best to one that offers urban experience and enticements. I'm not claiming that a handful of TV shows has produced a new urban generation. But it's striking how pervasive this pro-city sensibility is within Generation X, the millennials, whatever you want to call them, those under 30. Very striking. I teach a class in urban policy. I've taught it at two different institutions over the last five years. And at some point in the course of the semester, I always ask the question, um, where would you like to live in, 20, in 15 years? And they all say either, I want to live out in the country or in a small town. Some of them say that. And the others say, I want to live in a big city. Nobody says, I want a house in the suburbs on a cul-de-sac. Nobody ever says that. Of course, then I say, well, would you like to give up your car in order to do this? And everybody says, no. Uh, we haven't made many stra uh, uh, strides toward the carless life, except maybe in Manhattan. Chicago, Boston, and San Francisco. It's not that cars and demographic inversion aren't related. They are. In Atlanta, maybe the place with Washington, D.C. that has probably seen the most dramatic return of the upper middle class to the city, the main reason is traffic. Ten years ago, people didn't, amount, didn't object to a 20-mile commute in Atlanta. Now they do because it takes much longer. You know, objection to traffic is based on comparison to the past, not on objective reality. If it used to take you 10 minutes to get somewhere and now it's 20, you don't like that. And when it gets to 30, you think, where are the good old days when I could get around in 20 minutes? You know, it, it's, it's entirely incremental in that way and relative, as so many judgments that we make are. Then you throw in... The, the price of gas, which is currently about $3 where I live. I don't know anybody that doesn't think it's going to be closer to $5 in a few years. Uh, and you have another huge factor. Look at the changes that occurred in urban real estate just in the time when gas went above $4 in 2008. Huge changes. A lot of them didn't get completed because of the recession. But developers flocked to ideas of urban life. Somebody once made the comment that developers make sheep look like independent actors. Uh, there's some truth to that. And developers were into cities in 2007. No question about that. Of course, we predicted high gas would mean a return to cities before in the 1970s, and it didn't happen. Gas came down, sprawled to the suburbs, just gained traction. But that was OPEC. This is worldwide demand. And I'm not an expert by any means in energy, worldwide energy policy. But everything I read says it's only going to increase. I mean, China and India are not going to want less oil. They're going to want more oil, a lot more oil, even though they're doing, China particularly is doing some things to reduce its dependence. Now, gas is going to go up. Some suburb, suburbanites will just stay where they are and accept the cost. That's going to happen. Families with four children and a gas grill are not going to automatically pick up and move to a loft in downtown Chicago. I mean, uh, that's just, there are an awful lot of those people, and many of them are going to stay put. But others will, will decide to stop paying $100 every few days for a tank of gas that will allow them to commute 40 or 50 miles round trip. They'll decide they don't want to do that. Ultimately, though, I believe demographic inversion is less a result of middle-aged people changing their minds than it is of young adults expressing different values, habits, and living preferences. Just as political change is not usually the result of middle-aged people deciding to be somebody else, but of a younger cohort coming into the electorate. We saw that in 2008. Um, and all the crucial democratic, democratic, demographic changes in American life the last generation, more singles, cohabitation, later marriage, smaller families, and at the other end, the rise of healthy, active adults in their 60s and 70s, the boomers and the oncoming boomers. All these are factors that make demographic inversion not only possible but likely. When the recession is over, 
we will go back to having millions of people with earning power or substantial savings who can live where they want. I don't think that will require a boom of the, of the sort we had in the first half of this decade, but a modest prosperity will create that. And many will choose central cities. As they do this, others will find themselves forced to live in less desirable places, far from the center of the metropolis. So suburbs like Gwinnett, that never dreamed of being entry points for immigrants, will have to cope with new realities. It's no surprise that the argument, when you think about this, the arguments in, in, big, in metropolitan areas about immigration and the intensity in the of the debate about immigration has not occurred in the traditional immigrant areas of the city. It's, in, it's occurred 30 miles out in the suburbs. That's where people are fighting about this because that's where the immigrants are going. In Washington, not to Adams Morgan, but to Prince William County, where they're fighting about it. Now, if you step back and take a look at everything I've said, which you may not want to do, but in case you do, um, there are, and I, I, would be, I would be remiss in not pointing out that there are responsible critics who look at all this and see a lot made out of very little. In absolute terms, they argue a return to the urban center is a minor demographic event. And they have a point. In me most metropolitan areas in the first few years of the new century, more people move to the suburbs than move downtown. That's true. If you take my yardstick, is if you take a city with half a million, so what, two and a half times bigger than Worcester, maybe. Um, if you have a city of half a million, if you've got 25,000 downtown residents, you have a vibrant downtown. That's 5%. It doesn't take much. That city can claim it is in the midst of a downtown revival. Charlotte, which is a place I've spent some time, lots of excitement about downtown living. Uh, slowed down again. Charlotte has had awful problems as a result of the financial meltdown, and it's not buildings that were under construction are not finished. I know all that. Uh, and their residential population is still not 12,000. So it's small. And those 12,000, or slightly less, are not representative of the whole area. Fewer families, as you would expect, fewer families with school-age kids, mostly the usual gentrification suspects, singles, couples, empty nesters. Those phrases are put together in one phrase now, singles, couples, empty nesters. You sort of say it as one word. The bulk of married families with children in the middle class has not only been living in the suburbs, it has been moving to the suburbs, or it was moving to the suburbs, until 2007. What remains to be seen is how many people in the year 2015 are going to want to move out 40 miles from the city. I suspect many fewer. That doesn't mean the ones who are there are all coming in, but the number who are going to want those houses is going to be less. Now, Joel Kotkin, who doesn't believe any of this and who is a responsible and serious critic, says something simple. Till the middle class starts turning up on downtown streets, we're talking about a blip. Well, my answer to that is it's not a blip. The best evidence is that until the recession, almost certainly after the recession, the real issue for downtowns wasn't the supply, wasn't the demand, it was the supply. If Charlotte had had 30,000 residential units downtown in 2007, it could have filled them. The residential population of Wall Street exploded in the 18 months before the middle of 2008. It will resume once credit returns. You walk down Wall Street on a Saturday morning, you see baby strollers, something you didn't see 10 years ago. But even if the critics are mostly right, even if most cities never see a downtown residential boom of massive proportions, and I'm prepared to admit that if, we're, if, if you say massive proportions, I'll agree, no, that's not going to happen. There's no doubt that the demographic inversion is taking place. The crucial issue is not the number of people living downtown, though that matters. The crucial issue is who they are and the ways in which urban life is changing as a result. So what would a post-inversion city look like? Maybe a little like Vienna in 1900, when the elite paraded down the Ringstrasse and the circular downtown promenade along the Danube and went to concerts and ate pastry at sidewalk cafes while talking about serious subjects. You know how the Eskimos have 32 terms for snow? The Viennese had about 40 terms for pastry. It just depends on what you're interested in. 
or Paris, where the boulevards were for the rich and the poor were banished to the industrial suburbs. Nobody would hold up modern Paris with thousands of unemployed immigrants seething in shoddily built suburban high-rise projects as a model for 20th century urbanism. Indeed, in the worst case, demographic inversion would result in the poor living out of sight and largely forgotten in high-rises beyond the city border, with the rich in gated enclaves downtown. But I think this is unlikely. People with means move to the center now to escape suburban gatedness, not to recreate it. That's true in most cities that I've seen. Urban condos may have elaborate security systems, but the inhabitants won't be walled off, to the, won't be walled off from the street. They will want to be part of the street. In a city that is doing this successfully, the street is the key to, to all of this. Life in the street, as Jane Jacobs would say, is the key to a downtown that works. And the idea of warehousing the poor in high-rise ghettos has, thank God, gone out of fashion in this country, virtually, not virtually everywhere, everywhere. Those, ghetto, those high rises are coming down and being play, replaced with other forms of subsidized housing. But then there are slightly, slightly less dystopian prophecies, like those of Christopher Lineberger, whom you may have read who goes much further than I do. He says, a dramatic increase in center city population will in fact take place, and one result will be the deterioration of today's car-dependent suburban tract homes into the slums of 2030. He wrote a cover story in the Atlantic Magazine called, which you may have seen, called Suburbia, the Next Slum. I can't remember if there was a question mark after next slum or not. There may have been, or there may not. I don't think this will happen either in such extreme form. For one thing, there are not enough lofts or townhouses to triple the number of downtown residents very easily. And as the center city population continues to grow, citizens already there will resist the demand for more skyscrapers. So this is a population that will grow, but it will grow at a measured pace. Um, the people who have moved to lofts in downtown Charlotte don't want to be overwhelmed by skyscrapers if they can help it. So what seems to me the most likely way to satisfy a much bigger urbanized population is to retrofit and urbanize the suburbs, as we're already seeing in some places. Denver we'll talk a little bit about. Tyson's Corner in Washington. I like to say if you can make an urban place out of Tyson's Corner, you can make it anywhere. Um, but none of this suggests exurbia will turn into a wasteland. The price of houses will go down and make them more attractive for newcomers, which is already happening in the far suburbs of, of American big cities. Those trying to rise in the American economy, immigrants, just like those in Gwinnett County. And by the way, immigrants tend to like, they want to live in the suburbs. They are used to being crowded for space. They like the idea of space. They are not jaded about suburban living. It's difficult to become jaded about something you've never experienced and possesses so many su superficially beneficial attributes. You know, urbanists have complained for years that the immigrants and the poor in the inner city have a hard time commuting to jobs in the suburbs, the so-called transportation spatial mismatch. Well, if they live in the suburbs, they'll be closer to the jobs because that's where the jobs are now in, in most metropolitan areas. Most big cities, a majority of the jobs are not downtown. So transportation will remain a problem, but it's not one that can't be solved. And somewhere in between these scenarios lies the vision of Jane Jacobs, who idealized the Greenwich Village of the 1950s and the casual everyday relationships that made life there comfortable, stimulating, and safe. Much of what Jacobs loved won't return. The era of the mom and pop grocer, the shoemaker, the candy store has ended for good in most places. Less so in immigrant neighborhoods than in other neighborhoods. You will see a mom and if you go, if you walk through uh, uh, Bushwick in Brooklyn, you'll see bodegas by the dozens that are family run, family run grocery stores. Um, but they're in the immigrant neighborhoods. For much of the rest of us, for the middle class, this is big box, big chain century. 
I'm not so foolish as to assume that that trend is going to be reversed. We're going to buy hardware at at Lowe's and Home Depot, and we're going to buy appliances at Best Buy, and that isn't not at the local TV repairman. That's that's not going to change. But the young urban elites of the 20th century are looking for some of the things Jacobs value, even if they haven't all heard of her. They're drawn to a densely packed urban life they saw on TV and found more interesting than the cul-de-sac world that they grew up in. By and large, I believe central cities or their suburban recreations will give it to them. The suburbs, to stay afloat, will urbanize. This is already taking place. Denver is probably the leading example. It turned an old 70s shopping center into a new place called Belmar, which is a, a town center. So there are suburbs are fanatic about town centers these days. I was in Houston a few weeks ago, and quite a few miles from downtown Houston, you have places called Sugarland and uh, and the Woodlands. Big places. The Woodlands has 80,000 residents. And they are putting in centers with reflecting pools and lofts, uh, lofts surrounding them and retail. And they are telling everybody in their advertising that they want to create the urban experience. Come here and live an urbanized life. That's what the ads say. I looked them up. Um, now, there's one flaw in this thinking. The urbanized life, by some people's standards, requires some form of public transportation, and you can't get to the woodlands without a car. Now, Houston is building a huge light rail system. It's going to have, if they finish it on time, they won't finish it on time, but they'll finish it, 63 stations by the year 2015. Are we going to have transit-oriented development around those stations? Tell me what the price of gasoline is, and uh, I could probably give you a better guess. But my guess is yes. So all of these, or almost all of these, car-created suburbs built in the 70s and 80s have created town centers in the past five years or tried to, or tried to impose a street grid on a strip mall landscape. That's the hardest part. You can build new kinds of buildings. You can build pseudo lofts. But trying to make a grid out of something that is not built like a grid is very difficult, and yet they're doing it. A lot of them don't work, but we're only going to see more of this. And in many ways, it's the answer to the desire of the millennial generation for an urban life. It can't all be lived smack in the middle of downtown New York. A lot of people don't want to live in downtown New York anyway. But it can be in downtown Charlotte or Minneapolis, or more likely along the transit lines that will flow out from these places. We aren't seeing a lot of it yet, but we're seeing a lot of plans. Now, in the 1990s, a flurry of academics and journalists, me among them, wrote books lamenting the decline of community and predicting that it would reappear in some fashion in the new century. I think that's starting to happen in the downtowns of America at least many major cities of America. And that the recession, as I say, represents only a pause, not a closure. And I think for all its pitfalls, demographic inversion will do more good than harm. We aren't going to return to the close-knit but constricting form of community life that prevailed 50 years ago. Most of us wouldn't want to. But as we rearrange ourselves in and around many of our big cities, we are groping toward the new communities of the 21st century. Um, I have taken my time, and I would be glad to answer any questions that people have in the time remaining. Yes? How are medium-sized cities uh, outside of Charlotte, like the Buffaloes, the Clevelands, the Providences, how are they doing in this recreation, trying to get singles, couples, and empty nesters in? And what do they do right? What do they do wrong? And what should we look to do? Uh, that's a perfectly reasonable question to which I don't have a simple answer. Providence has done it very well. Um, in the ideal case, you have a major university 
you have a state capital. Uh, all those things are job induce are are, uh, are inducements to people to live downtown, where those institutions are located, and you're seeing that in Providence. You mentioned Cleveland and Buffalo. There, I think the problem is um, not enough jobs downtown. You know, there's there's a we talked about this yesterday. There's a Roberta and I did. There's a difference of opinion as to whether you create amenities and you attract young people and the creative class to come and live where the amenities are. And this is the Richard Florida thesis. And then there's another point of view which says, you've just got to have jobs downtown. And when you have jobs downtown, people will live there and the amenities will sprout up. These things aren't mutually exclusive. You can attract jobs and sprout amenities all at the same time. Um, they work together. Chicago lost more manufacturing jobs in the last generation than any city in America. But it replaced them. That's why Chicago is doing so well. Every, every place has lost manufacturing jobs. There's not a city in this country that has a manufacturing economy comparable to what it had 30 years ago. The question is, are they replacing them with other jobs? Um, a lot of that depends on whether corporations make a commitment to the center city. Uh, a lot of it depends on ed, the so-called ed-med strategy, education and hospitals. Um, from what little I know of Worcester, uh, a lot of the successes you have been having have to do with education and hospitals. And this is, what, this is why Pittsburgh has separated itself from Buffalo. Great universities and um, mammoth health care centers. Birmingham is starting to see that. Um, so those are some of the ways the, city accompli the city's accomplished this. Will every city accomplish it? No. I would not, and I think Ed Glazer probably said when he was here that there are some cities for which there's very little hope and other cities in which all of these things that I'm talking about will probably happen. And it's, I can't predict precisely which is which. Uh, thank you. I was going to ask on the same lines of, have you any particular insights into Worcester uh, as a, um, a middle city, a gateway city um, that is working on finding its new identity, again, with EdMed, as you said, but um, I wondered if you had any particular insights for Worcester. I, I don't know much about Worcester. The last time I was here was 1997. I was, uh, g given the fact that some of the economic statistics for Worcester look pretty good, I was ex expecting downtown to have changed more than it had in the last 15 years. And I didn't see that. And I think that has to do with local factors that I don't completely understand. But Worcester seems to me a city that's ripe for some of these developments. Uh, you've got the universities, you've got the medical centers. Um, there are there if if the amenity this is a place where if the amenities exist areas can be created in toward the center of town where people will live but it's obviously not happening yet all right uh, let me let me follow oh up i'm that, sorry you go ahead that question um what are the advantages to um having a 50 acre freight yard abutting downtown worcester when our emphasis up to this point was ed med well, I would say not great, um, although I think that the increased train service from Worcester to Boston is bound to generate some activity, um, especially if you can increase it beyond the extent to which it's already been increased. When I was in Houston, I saw things that I wouldn't have believed, which is people putting up expensive townhouse developments right next to railroad yards. The absence of zoning, as many of you know, has made Houston a place where you can put absolutely anything next to almost anything. And so Houston is a place that takes some time to get rid of. In Houston, people would say, luxury condos next to a freight yard? Sure, why not? Put them anywhere. Um, but there aren't many Houstons. And I heard people in Houston tell me, people are moving into places in this city and paying good money for something I would never live in in a million years. But they're doing it. They're doing it because that's the culture of Houston. But I think it's fairly unique. I just wonder. Okay, I just wonder if you can discuss how downtown New York happened, though, because I'm sorry. If you could discuss how downtown New York happened, because of course originally, you know, living in a loft was illegal. There were lots of pioneers, lots of artists who did all of this, 
and of course zoning and I mean not zoning so much but just laws had to be changed for this to happen so if you could discuss the background yeah uh, I mean New York is a special case you know New York has Greenwich Village and in Soho but if you talk about the financial district which I mainly focused on New York has lots of class B and C office buildings built in the 1930s um, that are not desirable now. First of all, there are a lot fewer financial jobs in, in, in the what's called fire finance, insurance, real estate, finance, insurance, and real estate, um, this, which supplied something like two-thirds of the jobs in the financial district a generation ago, supplies closer to a third now, and you have more uh, artistic companies, architects, public relations, that sort of thing, moving downtown, as well as residents. But the key fact is that these old buildings are not easily convertible to modern office buildings. There's just too much technology involved. But they're easily convertible into condos. You can take a 30-story 1925 office building that would make a lousy office building now, but it makes a pretty good condo. All you need is the demand. And in 2007, up till for, for five years up to that point, there was an explosion in demand. Um, the, the reason why there are only 4,000 people living in downtown Houston is they tore down all the old office buildings. There's nothing to convert. I don't know what Worcester's situation is. You need a critical mass, though. I mean, people don't want to live in one office building surround, one converted office building surrounded by nothing. New York just had such a huge number of those things, as it has a huge number of almost everything, that it had a neighborhood and buildings that were not used at their previous potential and were waiting to be converted into residence. And the demand for residential space, of course, in New York is enormous. And people, Bushwick, which is one of the ugliest neighborhoods I have ever been to, in the outskirts of Brooklyn, the home of Jackie Gleason and Mae West, uh, among others. That'll take some of you back a ways. Um, People are moving out from Lower Manhattan to Williamsburg, which has become artsy and sort of trendy, and then they go out one step further to Bushwick, and they reclaim buildings that are not at all attractive. But Bushwick is where the artists went in 2007 and 2008. Um, and I think that's, that's probably going to continue. I should say that, that one of the most important factors in New York is that the subways are safe. You wouldn't want to have a place in Williamsburg in the 1970s and ride out there from lower Manhattan every night, even though it's a 10-minute ride, because it was dangerous. The subways are not dangerous anymore in New York. And that's made a tremendous difference in opening up parts of Brooklyn that were off limits to development for a generation or more. In the back. Hi. Yeah, real quickly, I think Worcester is kind of interesting. Yeah, the there is some very strong economic indicators. but. A lot of the growth, of, for example, the, you talk about an ed-med strategy. Our largest hospital, UMass, is actually a couple miles from downtown. A lot of the growth from the jobs perspective has been outside of downtown. But you, so you said there's that, that side, the kind of medical stuff is a little further away. St. Vincent's is, a, is relatively close, which is the, right out the window here. But you talked about an ed strategy as well. We have the Mass College of Pharmacy, for example, expanding and taking an old hotel. There is some discussion saying, well, that takes it off the tax rolls, and that's a bad thing. Sounds to me, from your perspective, you're trying to get a critical mass and some kind of tipping point to bring people downtown. That that necessarily might be a, that might be a good idea to pay, have more college to, and, and stu student housing kind of built downtown. Is is that what I'm hearing from you? And the second part of that is, what are some of the amenities? We have some growth that's going to happen with the City Square project, bringing more jobs downtown. But the question is, kind of, what are the other amenities that a city like Worcester might want to invest in on the short term to kind of help reach that tipping point? So. First of all, is, it, is the return from getting college and universities that don't pay taxes but still bring students, is that worth that investment? And what are the amenities we might think about real quickly to kind of attract other growth? I think if you could convert a hotel downtown into luxury or, or market rate condos, you'd be better off. Um, the demand might not exist here. I don't know. It's not that you don't need a dormitory, but you do need market rate housing in the center of the city. Um, I'm not familiar enough with the neighborhoods around the universities to know whether you could have a resurgence there. It doesn't have to be in the middle of downtown. Um, a resurgence in urban life can occur anywhere in a city. In Pittsburgh, a lot of it is not downtown. It's out where uh, the University of Pittsburgh is and in, in uh, Oakland in that, in that part of the city. Um, 
I can't remember if there was a third part to your question. Well, the, the, the easiest amenity and the first one that comes in is restaurants and cafes. And, you know, you walk down Tryon Street in Charlotte, uh, you can't buy a pair of socks, but you can get a hazelnut latte in about six different places. Um, and a lot of people de deride that as, uh, as uh, latte urbanism, you know. What if you have a downtown and it's full of expensive restaurants and no shopping? Well, there are a lot of those. And the only thing I can say is that when you get enough people living downtown, shopping will, shopping will return. But it's not going to be people buying refrigerators. I don't think that's going to happen anymore. Uh, or cars. Not that you necessarily want car dealerships downtown anyway. Uh, the second stage would be boutique shopping. You know, the sorts of things that people take a little trip downtown and they see, well, thousand villages from our stuff from around the world and quilts from Indian tribes in Alaska and all the kinds of things you can buy in these places. Th those can come in. A lot of them fail, but um, some of them don't. And that's another amenity. Um, but the biggest amenity of all is people living down there. Not ne either downtown or in neighborhoods surrounding educational institutions or major employment institutions. People li like living, and, and the younger generation more, likes living close to where they work. If they can do it in a reasonable way, they're going to do it. And Worcester is a big enough city that you ought to have enough people like that. I think I would, I would be willing to bet that you have more of a problem of supply than you do of demand. But I don't know. Good morning. Thanks for coming to Worcester. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question. Given that jobs is often at the forefront of a lot of the downtown revitalization talk, um, I'm curious, in the age of more service-based and information-based economy, where there's people that um, are unemployed, underemployed, or, and or aspiring entrepreneurs, are you noticing any sort of shift in downtown redevelopment strategies based on the fact that a lot of people are becoming independent contractors, self-employed, creative entrepreneurs? Um, I think that's an important segment of the economy for downtowns to attract. I'm not sure what policy attracts them. I mean, that seems to me something Ed Glazer would say, that's something the market has to do. The market has to make those places attractive, and then you need to get a critical mass. Richard Florida would say you need a lot of artists and gay people. But they need to be doing something. I mean, th they need to be involved in the economic life of the city. So I think that attracting the small entrepreneur, yes, there are, you know, I'm not an expert on this policy, but there are probably things that cities can do, say, to, to bring in entrepreneurs to your main square and create a little more life there. But I think, by and large, the market has to do that. Cities are better at building big projects and as I've seen just in the last few hours looking around Worcester, um, you've had some failures. And you're not the only city that had them. In the 70s and 80s, we tried a lot of things that didn't work. Pedestrian malls, shopping malls that tried to make cities look like suburbs when the advantages of cities are that they are cities, not that they are suburbs. Cities aren't going to get anywhere by pretending to be suburbs. What we have now is suburbs wanting to look more like cities. We have the reverse of what we had in the 1980s. And it's a very powerful development. This Pinocchio, what I call in Phoenix and in other suburbs around, not, not, not Phoenix, not a suburb, but in suburbs around the country, the Pinocchio syndrome. You had a question. Um, I, sorry. Oh, I'm I, sorry. Someone else has a question. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about I'm speak the up use. Just a bit. I am, I'm curious um, to hear your thoughts about the use of open space as a way of attracting people downtown or creating, you know, a, a, an experience that would really uh, promote community and, and social interaction in cities? I, I think that open space works when there's something interesting for it to be around. I think if, you're, if you start by building a big open space, that's not a very good way to proceed. If people are living downtown and they want a place to play, um, like the waterfront park in Portland, Oregon, that's so successful, for example, that was built over a destroyed freeway. Um, 
that works. If you say our strategy downtown is we're going to create a big open space, um, you're going to you're going to have an open space that not many people want to go to. Some of them are going to be people that the people you want to go there won't want to be around. That's just that's just human nature. So I'm kind of dubious on open space as a main strategy. I think it's a complement to other ways of developing a community. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, my name is Sicilianos, and uh, I have lived in Europe, and I have lived in Gwinnett County. Not, not, did in Gwinnett in County? Gwinnett County. Uh, and in Atlanta, I did a lot of work in, uh, in Georgia and Atlanta and places like that. And what, what grew uh, Gwinnett into an unbelievable place was the fear of minorities from the downtown uh, and, and now, of course, Gwinnett County has more wonderful minorities, and, uh, and the reverse has happened. Uh, MARTA was created, it says, was created to, to provide uh, transportation. So the movements uh, which I have studied uh, uh, way back in the uh, uh, early 60s and 70s with Dr. Doxiadis, if, if you have ever read his work, um, uh, have happened and are happening every day. And here, as a citizen of, Wor of Worcester, I see a wonderful city, but it, it has not yet developed an identity or a Pinocchio syndrome, you know. Uh, a little bit of a Pinocchio syndrome that Worcester wants to become uh, something that they feel comfortable with. And that it once was. Right. Uh, one question I wanted to uh, uh, put in, uh, w what do you think about this retirement mega structures that are denying downtown with a lot of nice, uh, successful people that could have been uh, housed in, in, in well-developed areas in, in within the urban uh, area. Again, I, I'd give the answer, uh, and this is something I don't know a lot about. I probably should know more. But I, I would tend to give the answer to retirement developments as I would to open space as a mixture in, in which there are market rate developments and there, are, and there is economic vitality, it's certainly fine to have senior citizens centers and retirement communities. Uh, but you can't build an economy on that, and I don't think you can build downtown vibrancy on that if it's the only thing you're doing. Unfortunately, sometimes it's the easiest thing to do. And so you get them, and you have them in Worcester, I believe. In, Well, I wouldn't want to, um, particularly as I get older, denigrate the need for housing for older people. However, places like Worcester need market rate housing in the center or close to the center. I mean, it need, they need jobs, but you've got jobs. The jobs aren't all in the center, but they're, if, if I understand correctly, they're close enough to create neighborhoods in which this kind of vibrancy could exist. Um, but the recession has to end, and then you have to get developers interested in doing this. I don't think the city, the city can do some things. They can make the permitting process easier. Again, these are things Ed Glazer probably talked about when he was here. They can make it easier for developers to build and locate. In Houston, they made it so easy that you can put up anything anywhere. You don't have to go that far. But that's what cities can do. But developers have to, have to create cities. It's, it's not city planners who create cities. It's developers. I mean, I think we've, we've learned that over and over again. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, the cities that have more historic buildings and historic neighborhoods have a better potential for the future development? Yeah, I think that's true in Providence. Um, the part of Providence's secret is that it just, maybe it was too poor, but it didn't tear, it didn't tear down a lot of stuff. And Federal Hill is sort of an exciting, vibrant place to live, where the working class Italians um, have been replaced by um, middle class uh, people of all uh, social and ethnic backgrounds, mostly Anglo. The north end of Boston. The north end of Boston isn't a working class Italian neighborhood anymore. It's a gentrified neighborhood. Um, and a lot depends on housing stock. If you've got the housing stock, you've got a big advantage. 
I get to ask the last question. <laughs> um, the Brookings Institution just came out with uh, a study about uh, demographic changes. And Worcester seemed to do fairly well according to their standards. Would you comment on that at all about you know what they said um, about uh, you know Worcester's prospects and you know what what aspects we were uh, succeeding at? Worcester did in this. This was a Brookings study of the hundred largest metropolitan areas. I don't know where do you rank in that. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember. But you'd be somewhere in the top hundred, probably. Um, because that's, I think, as, as, as far down as they dug. Um, Worcester did fabulously well in this Brookings study. Uh, job creation, um, income growth. It wasn't that it made well Worcester into a wealthy city, but to a city that was really dynamic and developing. Um, what I notice is the contrast between all of that activity, all of that life, and physical Worcester. It doesn't seem to be keeping pace physically with the things that are happening economically. And somehow you have to get to the point where those things can work together. And then you'll really have something. Thank you very much. Sure. Mayor Joe O'Brien and I want to wish Roberta and the Research Bureau a happy 25th anniversary. 25 years of providing important research and data to our municipal governments and to the community and business leaders to help make good decisions to help make our community thrive. Thank you for your great work. I'm thrilled to be part of the anniversary of the uh, Research Bureau. I was involved in its creation. So for me, I think what has happened over the years has been marvelous for what Roberta has accomplished and the Research Bureau. And I'm proud to still be part of it. Hi, I'd just like to wish Roberta and the uh, Research Bureau a happy 25th anniversary. We've been very pleased to be a part of this process at Webster 5, and we're excited about continuing relationship with the Bureau. Well, congratulations to the Research Bureau on its anniversary. Brings such uh, vibrant discussions to downtown Worcester about downtown Worcester. It's really appreciated as a as a resident of the Worcester Public Library and having uh, knowing that people are caring about the downtown part of the city of Worcester. Congratulations. Yeah.